So if you were to go to some of the big developing country uh, capitals around the world, they're more concerned about local air pollution uh, than they are necessarily about climate change. That's what's affecting public health today. That's affecting the productivity of their workers today. That's affecting everybody, you know, the health of your kids, the health of your parents. And if you can design a climate change policy that can both deliver lower carbon energy and reduce the emissions of fine particulate matter that causes adverse health effects, ozone that contributes to smog, I think then you're getting sort of two for one. You're getting the climate benefit, you're getting the, the immediate public health benefit from improved air quality. That I think can also help support politically a, uh, a more ambitious climate change program and, and secure broader, broader stakeholder support. Hi, I'm Joe Aldi. I'm a professor of the practice of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And my research focuses on energy policy, climate change policy, and regulatory policy. I think the first thing that economists do is they, they look at the key insights from climate science and understand how that can inform both our understanding of the damages that people will bear from climate change today and in the future, but also understand the climate science and how that can inform the design of policies that can mitigate the risk uh, posed by climate change. So some of that will include understanding if climate change, say, is going to increase uh, the frequency of wildfires, as we've seen recently in California or Australia, if it's going to increase the intensity of hurricanes that may be hitting the coast and the people who live there, we can use our tools to better understand what are those economic damages, both in terms of the lost productivity, uh, the potential loss of jobs, but also how people's welfare and well-being are being adversely impacted, even if it's not something we might measure, say, in uh, the national income and product accounts through uh, GDP, such as people having worse health because they're breathing either more polluted air or because the higher temperatures are actually complicating some of their pre-existing health conditions, uh, say if you're old or if you're an infirm uh, infant. So there's a lot about how economics can help us understand the damages from climate change that can then motivate public policy. But there's a lot as well about how we understand how climate change can inform the design of the policies to reduce emissions of CO2, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases. The fact that if you emit a ton of carbon dioxide in Boston or Beijing, it has the same impact on the global climate. It has the same damages that people will feel around the world. So that's one reason why it's important to make sure we're reducing emissions both in our own country but working with other countries around the world to reduce those emissions. We can then use some of the tools of economics to assess where are there low-cost ways of driving those emission reductions. Some things are easier to do and to change in our economy to reduce emissions, and some things are harder. And it makes sense to take those easier actions first, learn from that, and build on that to then go after the tougher emission reductions down the line. So what we're seeing in practice uh, in the United States and in countries around the world are really, I think, a, a fascinating mix of policies to try to reduce carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And some are, are in a sense, a kind of byproduct, uh, if you will. The, the climate reductions are a byproduct of other policies. So, for example, in the United States, we've had fuel economy standards to improve the efficiency of the vehicles we drive on the books since the mid-1970s. The initial motivation for that was to address concerns about dependence on foreign oil. What we've seen more recently, though, is that aggressive efforts to improve the fuel economy can deliver significant reductions in carbon dioxide emissions because we're burning less gasoline and less diesel for people to drive in their cars and light trucks. We see some policies that are clearly designed to target carbon dioxide emissions directly that can take the form of emission taxes. So if you emit carbon dioxide, or in some cases, if you are an energy company that brings a fossil fuel to the market, that when it's burned emits carbon dioxide, you'll be taxed based on the carbon content of that fuel. And we've seen those policies in effect dating back to the early 1990s and much of Northern Europe. Uh, more recently, we've seen uh, British Columbia and Canada uh, implement a carbon tax. We're also seeing other subnational governments around the world, as well as some developing countries starting to pursue the use of a carbon tax. There's probably about 25 to 30 national and subnational governments that are explicitly pricing the emissions of carbon dioxide through a tax system. More common than that, though, probably 30 to 40 different places around the world, both supranational, meaning the EU, national governments, and some national governments are using so-called cap-and-trade programs. So this is the idea of a cap-and-trade program is to say, I'm going to set a, a quantity goal. 
the amount of, of carbon dioxide that all the firms in my, say, province or my country are allowed to emit. And then I take that total quantity goal and I divide it into emission allowances that grant the holder of that allowance the right to emit a unit of carbon dioxide. And you can auction those allowances off. We've seen that being used in California. We've seen that used in the Northeast states uh, here in the US. Uh, you can also give those allowances away for free, say as a function of historic emissions. And then firms can buy and sell that right so that if you're a low cost firm, it's really easy for you, really low, inexpensive for you to reduce your emissions of carbon dioxide. You can do that and sell emission allowances you no longer need for compliance purposes to another firm that may have higher cost of reducing their pollution. And, and this kind of market for pollution that emerges ensures that we're able to drive low cost uh, efforts uh, to achieve our climate change goal. And, and truly given the scale of the challenge, and this is one thing that, that is, 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 I think, sets climate change apart from a lot of other environmental problems. We're really talking about changing the energy foundation of the modern economy. The cost here is measured in trillions, maybe tens of trillions of dollars over the coming decades. The length of time necessary to solve this problem is much longer than what we've seen historically with other environmental problems. So it's one reason why I think it's important for us to gain some of the insights from economics to drive public policy that can really minimize our costs of reducing emissions. Because otherwise, we end up spending more money than we need to. It means we have fewer resources we can dedicate to other problems. It also, I think, creates political economy challenges, that if, if we're spending a lot of money to reduce emissions more than we need to, it may start to create some backlash uh, against the effort to try to tackle the problem of climate change. We also see in other parts of the world, and also some here in the United States, where we subsidize directly some of our favorite technologies, subsidizing solar, the installation of solar panels, subsidizing the construction of wind farms, subsidizing energy efficient uh, uh, appliances, energy efficient uh, investments in the home, um, electric vehicles. So this is another way, and, and, and I think in practice, what we have is not one preferred option or another, but the policies that we see in those places around the world that are most aggressive tackling climate change, they're using a mix of the policy instruments. And, and I think it creates an opportunity for us to learn what works well, what may work better than other things, and, and what are the, the impacts when we mix these instruments together as, as, uh, as a package. So one thing that's important is I think we see differences in different economies around the world based on how they produce and consume energy already. So one example of that is we have seen in the United States carbon dioxide emissions fall quite significantly in the power sector because of the fracking revolution with natural gas has brought down natural gas prices quite dramatically. We've seen natural gas increase. We've seen as a result of both federal subsidies in the tax code and state mandates significant investment in wind and solar capacity. So as a result, we've seen emissions in the power sector in the U.S. come down by more than a quarter as the role of coal in the U.S. power system has declined. Right? If you look at, say, British Columbia, where they have a carbon tax that they ramped up to $30 a ton, that's a fairly significant carbon tax. But power in British Columbia is fairly clean. There's no coal in it. Right? So, so their, their benefits in reducing emissions are actually typically more on the transportation dimension and the industrial dimension, but not really in the power sector. Right? So one thing is to think about where are the opportunities, because coal is the dirtiest of the fossil fuels. You, you, you emit about twice as much CO2 to produce a unit of electricity from coal than it, from producing a unit of electricity from natural gas. So the question is, where are there places in the world where there's a lot of coal being burned? That's what you want to get out first. And that's where you can get a lot of emission reductions fairly cheap, especially as we've seen the cost of solar technology and wind power technology come down quite dramatically. There are a lot of places in the world now where you don't need much in terms of a policy impetus to push out these zero-emitting renewable technologies to displace this very dirty coal technology. The second place I would look for for sort of low-hanging fruit, which is related to the first one here, is where do we have climate change-oriented investments that deliver significant, what we term, co-benefits? And the one that comes to mind is local improvements in the local air quality. So if you were to go to some of the big developing country uh, capitals around the world, they're more concerned about local air pollution uh, than they are necessarily about climate change. That's what's affecting public health today. That's affecting the productivity of their workers today. That's affecting everybody, you know, the health of your kids, the health of your parents. Uh, 
And if you can design a climate change policy that can both deliver lower carbon energy and reduce the emissions of fine particulate matter that causes adverse health effects, ozone that contributes to smog, I think then you're getting sort of two for one. You're getting the climate benefit, you're getting the, the immediate public health benefit from improved air quality. That I think can also help support politically a, uh, a more ambitious climate change program and, and secure broader, broader stakeholder support. I think the fundamental challenge we face, especially when we think about international climate policy, and there have been efforts going back to 1992, the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, through the Paris Conference in 2015, trying to get a concerted, ambitious global effort to combat climate change. And I think there's a general consensus of what we need to do. In fact, you can look at, say, Paris. There's an agreement we were going to aim to limit warming to well below 2 degrees C relative to pre-industrial levels and try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. There's a lot of concern about how serious some of the climate change impacts around the world will be as we go from warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees C and beyond. And, and we've already, in a sense, baked in more than 1 degree C in the system. The challenge is how we distribute the effort, how we allocate that effort around the world. And there's one thing that I think anyone who's serious when they look at the data knows, we have to reduce emissions of CO2 in developing countries. You could take all the OECD countries and reduce their emissions to zero tomorrow. If there's not ambitious efforts to reduce emissions in developing countries, we're going to go well, below, well beyond 2 degrees C. The challenge, though, is how do we think about who's going to be financing those efforts and how they are going to be complementing the other policy priorities that countries around the world have. And, and that's something where I think the international negotiations are still kind of suffering. Uh, I think it's something where there can be a role for how we think about development aid, but I think more than sort of development aid or finance, it's thinking through what is a thoughtful, coherent, long-term development strategy that is climate resilient and hopefully even constructive in combating the climate change problem, that is creating you know, good employment opportunities and opportunities for an economy to continue to grow. The couple things that I want to note on this are, first, sometimes this is a debate that I think is shortchanging a lot of the impacts of climate change and, in fact, environmental quality more generally when we think about sort of a, um, a growth strategy in developing countries. GDP growing isn't doing justice to how we think about, say, the public health people enjoy. GDP is an incomplete measure. It's not accounting for those health impacts. It may not, in fact, if anything, it may, as we start spending more and more money to try to adapt to climate change, that actually looks good in GDP. Spending money to build seawalls will look good in GDP. But we'd rather not spend money on seawalls. We'd rather be spending money on uh, medical research or improving children's education. You know, those are the kinds of things that can actually help long-term growth uh, than, than trying to, to, to deal with these adverse impacts uh, because of climate change. I think it's also something where there are opportunities in developed countries to make that initial push, say, in implementing innovative low carbon or zero carbon technologies to help bring down the cost of those technologies that will make it easier to, to deploy them in developing countries. Uh, you know, we've seen a big ramp up in the investment in solar panels in the United States over the last five years. We actually benefited in the U.S. because of German subsidies 10, 15 years ago. The Germans were very aggressive in subsidizing solar on their rooftops. You started seeing solar prices come down. It then made it economic to see a, a really aggressive push out in the investment in solar. And we've in increased our capacity in solar more than our capacity of any other source of electricity in the United States over the last half dozen years. But that has then spillover benefits, say, for a country like India that now has a very ambitious goal for increasing its solar capacity. That's only really made feasible in part. You need some political will, but you also need inexpensive technology. And so I think there's ways in which, as you have the developed countries can innovate, deploy commercially some of these new technologies, as they do that, if they're able to help drive down the cost of those technologies, it's going to make it easier for a developing country to both reduce its emissions and continue to address its uh, needs to grow their economies, to address their poverty concerns, so that you don't have this, this trade-off that makes it politically quite difficult to tackle the climate change problem. So one thing that is, I think, from a, an economist standpoint, that's just so fascinating about the climate change problem, is that you can draw off of the tools and the insights from so many different fields of economics.
right? So, you know, I've been lucky that I've worked on some issues where it's really applying insights from health economics and environmental economics to try to understand what are the damages of climate change. You can draw of, of insights from industrial organization to understand how to structure a regulation and how firms might respond to that regulation. Um, there's a lot of concern in the climate policy debate about how pricing carbon in one economy might impose um, adverse competitiveness impacts on, say, manufacturing relative to firms in another economy that draws off of our insights from international uh, trade. Uh, when we think about sort of the long-term impacts, we may be thinking about interactions with economic growth that draws off some of our insights from macroeconomics. So the first thing I want to say is, if you're a young economist who's interested in working on climate change, you have really the entire discipline of economics to draw from that can enable you to really answer, I think, or at least address really interesting, important questions about the future of climate change policy. Now, a few that come to mind. One is, I think, over the last few years, we've really seen a dramatic improvement in uh, the quality of research and the, the really fascinating research about the damages from climate change. And I think part of that is some of the, the um, causal inference uh, methods are being brought to bear so that we can do a much better job understanding the damages of climate change. I think we're starting to understand a little bit more about the distributional impacts of those damages that I think will be quite important both for understanding who across society can adapt to climate change versus those who may not have the resources or the means to adapt, and what does that mean in terms of the impacts of climate for those different populations. It certainly has an impact when we think about the political economy and the public support for climate change actions. I think there's also a growing interest in understanding uh, how economics can help us in, uh, uh, assess this sort of rich mix of policies in those economies that are being progressive and tackling the problem. Uh, I, I've said before when, when looking at, say, the state of California, they, they identified uh, the whole suite of potential policy actions and decided to implement them all. It's not clear that's actually the best strategy going forward. It's not clear that's the best example we want to set for, say, developing countries. But I think right now we're at an opportunity where we've had enough policy experience with sort of a mix of instruments, that there's a lot to sort of learn, that we can conduct retrospective analysis and try to see, well, which policies are most important at driving down emissions today, and which policies are most important at driving the innovation in new technologies going forward. That when we really think about what it means for the world, if we're successful in tackling climate change, it means in the latter half of this century, we don't emit any more CO2 in the world. It's kind of hard to imagine when we think about the last century plus of uh, industrial activity. But if that is the future that the scientists say we need to deliver on if we're going to be successful in tackling climate change, if we work back from that, what kind of innovations do we think we might need? And I don't mean to say, like, I need to know exactly the answer, but I might want to understand some of what are some of those characteristics. And then I work back from that and think through, okay, well, what are the, the kinds of policies I might want to pursue? to drive us towards innovations that have those characteristics that can help us deliver on that very ambitious transformation of our energy economy. And so I think there's a lot where economists can think through this sort of innovation problem uh, that can really help us understand sort of the long-term challenges and the long-term opportunities when we think about tackling climate change.